get started. Uh, lots of things to do. We have to learn quantum mechanics in the next hour and um, 40 minutes. Okay, so that'll be exciting. Uh, just a couple of administrative announcements before we get started. Um, uh, the schedule uh, this week is a little confusing, um, but not for this class uh, because we will not have lectures tomorrow because Tuesday is a Tuesday. Tuesday was originally a Monday, but thankfully now order has been restored and Tuesday is a Tuesday. Uh, Wednesday is also a Wednesday. Okay, so um, there will be class on Wednesday. And that's going to be the last class. Um, one other administrative announcement. Um, I have here um, uh, a sheet I'm handing out, just uh, some information about the final exam um, and some practice problems for the final exam. Uh, everything should be quite clearly stated here. Um, so it'll tell you, it says when the exam is. Um, uh, it says, roughly speaking, what's going to be covered. Maybe I'll just read through it so that we're all on the same page here. Um, yeah, so uh, the location of the exam hasn't been announced, so check the university exams website. Um, they'll have that information for you. Um, it's three hours, uh, no books, no notes, no calculators. Um, I am going to be holding office hours on Friday afternoon as usual for the next two weeks, so you can still continue to stop by if you have any questions. Um, the exam is based on everything that I've covered in class um, up through the last lecture of this course. Um, roughly that corresponds to some set of chapters in the textbook that I've listed here. Although not everything uh, in the textbook uh, was covered in class. Uh, those parts of the text that we didn't cover in class, you are not responsible for. Those things that we covered in class that are not in the textbook, you are responsible for. Okay, so the textbook is just a rough guide. Um, yeah, so as far as uh, uh, practicing for the exam, uh, go through uh, the lectures, go through the worked problems uh, in the textbook. Um, and I've listed here um, a bunch of problems that I think are fun uh, that you didn't do for problem sets uh, that you can do if you want some practice. Um, especially, I'd recommend working through the problems in chapters six and seven of the textbook uh, that I've listed here because um, you are responsible for everything that we did in this course, including the last two weeks, okay? But you didn't have a problem set uh, because, you know, I didn't want to have a problem set to the very last lecture, although I suppose I could have. I don't know why I didn't do that. Um, uh, anyway, apparently uh, I was feeling kind and so I didn't give you a problem set uh, the la due the last week. So uh, what that means is that you didn't have a problem set where you practiced uh, the material that you learned over the last week or two of class. Um, so I, I strongly recommend working through uh, the problems that I've listed here in chapters six and seven, just so you get a little feel uh, for what's going on. Okay. Um, are there any questions about uh, administrative matters, the exam, something like that? One other thing I should mention is that I will make sure that all of the problem sets are graded and that solutions are available before the exam. Uh, probably what will happen is they won't all be graded by uh, next Wednesday. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll, um, once they're graded, I'll put them in a box outside of my office for people to pick up at their convenience. And I'll send you an email when uh, that's ready for you to pick up. Question, yes. About how long before the exam should be expected? You know? I have no idea. The university said that they would announce it in late November. Okay, so. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, the, yeah, I mean, just a word, because a lot of you are new here. Um, the exams at McGill are centrally administered, um, so I have nothing. I write the exam, um, but I have no role in the scheduling or the proctoring or any of that stuff of the exam. Um, I will stop by the exam when you're taking it uh, to uh, answer any questions you might have about the interpretation of the problems, but uh, the university takes care of all of that stuff. Other questions, uh, comments, thoughts, feelings to share with the group? Okay, quantum mechanics. So, um, let me just remind you of a few things that we learned uh, last class before we left off. So, um, I remind you that the state of a particle in quantum mechanics is not, as in classical physics, represented by the position and momentum of the particle, but rather by a wave function, usually denoted psi, 
that depends on position and time. And then observable quantities, such as position, momentum, energy, and so forth of the particle, are represented by operators. For example, the observable that corresponds to the position of the particle is represented by the operator usually denoted x hat, which takes a wave function and multiplies it by the function x. The operator that measures the operator corresponding to the position the momentum of the particle is represented by a differential operator that involves the derivative with respect to x. The operator corresponding to the energy of the particle is given by 1 over 2m p squared plus v, the usual formula for kinetic plus potential energy, except where p is now regarded as this operator p hat that I've written down here. And in your life as quantum mechanics, you will understand uh, many, many, many other sorts of operators that would correspond to observables in quantum mechanics. And in discussing states and observables, it's useful to characterize those states that have definite values of the observables. So for example, when we say that a state psi has a definite value of the observable, that means that the expectation value of any function of that observable, which I remind you is defined as the integral dx of psi star times that function of the observable acting on psi, is just equal to that function of some number little a. So you can see then, according to this formula, if we had a state with a definite value of the momentum p, then that means that the variance of p, the expectation value of p squared, minus the square of the expectation value, would be equal to 0. And a state has a definite value of an observable when it is an eigenstate of the operator A. Meaning that it obeys the equation that A hat acting on psi is just a number times psi. And that number little a is called the eigenvalue. You may have encountered uh, the notion of an eigenvector and an eigenstate in your linear algebra classes. And indeed, the theory of quantum mechanics, to a very large extent, is just the theory of linear algebra. So all of those results that you're learning in your linear algebra classes are not just statements about linear algebra but you're really learning essentially the theory of quantum mechanics, although you may not know that that's what you're learning. Okay. That's the way life often works. So most states, however, do not have a definite value of a given observable. In the sense that if I handed each one of you some, uh, an identical quantum state psi, and I ask you to measure the value of some observable, say measure the position of the particle or measure the momentum of the particle, then you would, receive, then you would measure different results. And the way that we characterize the variation of the distribution of results that you would measure is by calculating the variance which is def called delta A, defined as the difference between, I'm sorry, difference between the expectation value of the square of the observable and the square of the expectation value. And we saw that in quantum mechanics, there is a fundamental limitation 
on what kinds of uh, states can have uh, what sorts of variances for different observables. That's given by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So uh, for example, we saw that if you, in any quantum state, the product of the variance in x with the variance in p is bounded below by h bar. That just means that it is simply impossible to construct a quantum state where you have definite values of position and momentum at the same time. You could try and have a definite value of the position, but that would mean that the uncertainty in the momentum delta p would be very, very large. And what I would like to do today is I would like to begin to use uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle to begin to estimate various effects in quantum mechanics. So we began thinking about this last time. So for example, if you're thinking about a particle in a box of size L, then the defin what you mean when you say that a particle is in a box of size L is that you have some knowledge about the position of the particle, and in particular, that the delta x, the variance in x, has to be less than L, meaning that the variance in P has to be greater than h bar over 2L, just using the Heisenberg uncertainty relation. And since E is equal to 1 over 2 mp squared, this implies that there is also some uncertainty in the energy, which is roughly h bar squared over m squared times l squared. And I put a little squiggly line there because this is really just some sort of order of magnitude estimate. Uh, in order to obtain precise results, we would need to characterize the states of this quantum system more precisely. But the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is essentially just a smart version of dimensional analysis, which allows you to at least guess the sorts of effects that would arise in quantum systems. So I'd like to pause for a minute and just think about this result a little bit. Okay. So in particular, what this means is that it is impossible for a particle in a box to have zero energy. In particular, it will always have uh, some finite amount of energy, uh, simply because it's confined to be in a small region of space. And, uh, yes, question. Why does the um, uncertainty in energy being posted mean that energy has to be posted? Well, what it means is, so w the question is, what exactly do you mean when you say the energy of the particle? What I mean when I say the energy of the particle is I prepare a bunch of uh, identical states, and I hand one to each one of you in the class, and you each measure the energy, okay? And uh, I compute the average value of the result that all of you measure. And the av that average value is going to be greater than or equal to something of order h bar squared over m squared times l squared. So if l is very, very big, that average value could be very small if I prepare the state appropriately, but it's going to be non-zero. Now there's some small probability that one of you might measure a value of the energy that's very, very small, maybe much less than this, but in quantum mechanics we really talk about probabilities, and so when I talk about the variance in the energy, I'm talking about an average over many measurements that uh, you are performing on identical quantum states. Now, um, I should pause uh, to, uh, we should really pause here uh, to bask in the glory of uh, this statement that I've written down here. 
It says that a particle in a box can't have zero energy. This fact uh, explains chemistry. Okay. This fact explains the stability of atoms. In particular, let's think about a model of an atom. Okay. What is an atom? An atom is an electron at its basic level. You could think of an hydrogen atom, which is an electron and a proton. Now, the electron and the proton have opposite charge. And one of the things that you know about electromagnetism is that things that have opposite charge attract. Okay. So the question then is, why doesn't an electron and the proton, why don't they just collide straight together, attract, uh, and um, their charge would completely cancel out? And the reason why they don't do that is quantum mechanics. Because an, for the electron to, be, to uh, be right in the nucleus of an atom, the, uh, it's like saying the electron is in a very, very, very small box, a box of order the size of the nucleus of an atom. And that means that the uncertainty in its momentum is very large. So what is that telling you? It's telling you that the electron might be in the nucleus of an atom, but it's not going to stay there very long because on average it's going to have a very, very large momentum. And so what that means is that if you were, for example, to measure the energy of an electron uh, in an atom, you would not find that the energy is minus infinity, which is what it would be if the electron were very, very close to the proton, but rather it would be some small but finite number. So what that means is that the um, electron doesn't want to sit exactly at the core of an atom, which is what would happen in classical physics, you know, you take an electron and a proton and they would just attract each other. Um, uh, but rather, what would happen is the electron likes to sit some finite distance away from the center of the atom. And that distance is determined by balancing two factors. One is the attractive force of electromagnetism, and the other is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Okay. So this implies chemistry. Chemistry uh, being another name for the study of the states of uh, atoms and molecules. Um, just to give you another slightly more sophisticated example of this uh, principle at work, I could, if I wanted to, uh, give you the problem of uh, an electron uh, uh, and a proton. Actually, I believe that was a problem on one of last, on last year's final exam for this course. So that might be a good thing for you to, uh, to, uh, to try and work out for yourselves. Um, let me give you a slightly simpler example uh, where we just have to think in one dimension rather than three dimensions. So let's consider a particle on a spring. Okay. So um, we have a particle. So we have some spring and some particles sitting at the end of the spring. And classically, the lowest energy configuration would be one where the particle is completely at rest. Uh, and the spring is in its equilibrium configuration. But Heisenberg's uncertainty principle tells us that that's impossible. Because if the particle is completely at rest, its position is known exactly, but its momentum is completely undetermined. So it's going to want to move around a lot. So our goal then is to try and find the minimum energy configuration where we balance these two effects. One is the desire of the particle to uh, be attracted to its equilibrium position of the spring. And the other is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So let's understand how to balance those two effects. So for a particle on, on a spring, the energy of the particle 1 over 2m p squared is, so the energy is the sum of the kinetic energy, 1 over 2m p squared, plus the kinetic energy, kx squared, where k is the spring constant. And I never remember, is there a factor of 1 half there? It's some conventions. We're just going to do dimensional analysis anyway, so those 1 halves aren't going to matter. Okay. 
So, um, uh, okay, let's put a one half there. Okay, good. Um, let's then imagine that we have a, uh, so here, when I write down this energy, x is the distance from the equilibrium position. That is to say, the distance from the position where the particle is at rest. So let's try and find when it is the energy of this particle is minimized in a way that is consistent with the Heisenberg uncertainty relation. So let's imagine that the harmonic oscillator, this particle on a spring, is moving in a way where its typical distance from the equilibrium position is equal to x. Then according to the Heisenberg uncertainty relation, E is going to be uh, of order p squared over m plus kx squared, where p squared is given by the uncertainty relation. So that's h bar squared over x squared. So this will be h bar squared over mx squared from the first term plus kx squared from the second term. Okay. And I'm going to try and give you an order of magnitude <coughs> estimate for the equilibrium, posi for the equilibrium uh, position of the spring in quantum mechanics. Uh, and because I'm doing an order of magnitude estimate, I'm going to forget about all numerical factors of a half, a third, anything like that. Okay. I'm just going to do some order of magnitude estimate. Okay. So this is the energy of the spring, of the particle on a spring, when it's moving on a trajectory uh, where it's moving of distances of order x. So it's oscillating back and forth with amplitude x. And we want to try and understand the minimum energy configuration. So we want to minimize with respect to x. Okay. So how do you minimize a function with respect to x? Well, you take its derivative and you set it equal to 0. So that's h bar squared over mx cubed plus kx. And again, I'm setting all numbers of order 1 equal to 0, forgetting about all the 1 halves and stuff like that that appear. And so this is equal to 0 when x to the fourth is of order h bar squared over mk. Okay? Just solving that equation. And there's some numbers of order 1 that I don't care about. Or when x is of order h bar squared over mk to the 1 quarter. Okay. The important point about this, of course, is that this is not equal to 0. What this means in quantum mechanics is that the lowest energy state of a spring will be non-zero. The spring will have some motion. The particle will be moving it'll be essentially oscillating in some way with an amplitude of order x, where x goes like h bar squared over mk to the 1 quarter power. So let's go ahead and use that to estimate the energy of the spring. So what do we do? We just plug that back into this, this equation for the energy. And so the energy will be of order just plugging this into the equation, uh, h bar times the square root of k over m. All I've done is plug that into this equation for the energy. Both terms in this are going to be of the same order. They're going to be of order h bar times the square root of k over m times some numbers of order 1. Or h bar times the frequency of the spring. Where I'm using the fact that the frequency of oscillation of the spring is the square root of 
the spring constant divided by its mass. Hopefully this formula should at least look, look at least a bit familiar to you. It's the formula for the energy of a photon, for example, in terms of its wavelength or in terms of its frequency. So we're seeing now that the formula E equals h nu or E equals h bar omega, depending on whether you're using frequency, regular frequency or angular frequency, is something much more general. It applies to harmonic oscillators as well. And um, uh, indeed, uh, this formula, E is of order h bar omega, is one that you are surely going to spend uh, a lot of time with in your lives as physicists. So I really want to emphasize that I've just worked out two examples, a particle in a box and a particle in a spring. But uh, these two examples really uh, convey, you know, we're not solving Schrodinger's equation or anything like that. We're just using the uncertainty principle to do some basic order of magnitude estimates. But it really captures a ton of quantum mechanical physics. So, so I think it's worth uh, thinking about uh, quite, quite, quite deeply. Uh, let me pause and see if there are any questions. Yes. Uh, no. We just showed that the energy can be zero, but it's not only at the uncertainty principle of physics. Speaking about last class, you were making distinction between the possible and improbable. Exactly. It's probable that it's, the particle has it's zero. Ex it's improbable that the particle has zero energy, but not impossible. Okay. In fact, the very next thing that I'm going to do is understand, is, is show you how these order of magnitude estimates that we've uh, written down here actually arise completely precisely using Schrodinger's equation. Uh, but before I do so, uh, another question. How did Heisenberg um, determine the uncertainty uh, Dimensional analysis. <laughs> okay. Right, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, that number of order, I mean, the uncertainty principle is a theorem in linear algebra. You, didn't, you don't call it the, you don't call it the uncertainty principle in linear algebra. So, um, you know, if you just want to do, you know, okay, I shouldn't say Heisenberg used order of magnitude. De Broglie sure, sure as hell used order of magnitude uh, when he wrote down the De Broglie wavelength. Heisenberg um, really understood the basic principle that we described er earlier in class, that observables are operators, and moreover, they're linear operators. And the theory of linear operators is the theory of linear algebra. Okay. And so he said, well, if observables are operators, then I can use results from linear algebra in order to understand how these observables behave. Okay. So we took these results from linear algebra along with the insight that um, quantum mechanics, uh, in quantum mechanics, observables are thought of as operators uh, to write down this uncertainty relation. It's actually a simple result in linear algebra. It might take me 15 minutes to prove, um, so I won't bother going through it. It's just, just math. Um, uh, but it, there's nothing terribly sophisticated about it. Um, it's called, uh, as we discussed last time, the Schwartz inequality. It's a version of the Schwartz inequality uh, in linear algebra. Other uh, questions? Good. So, Let's try and understand this precisely. So let me just work out the example of a particle in a box. Okay. So we want to understand the energy of a particle in a box. Okay. So we would like to ask the question, what states that is to say, what wave functions psi of x and t have definite values of the energy for a particle in a box? Okay. So what that means is that I'm looking for states psi of x and t, which are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, meaning that h psi is equal to e psi, where e is a number and h is 1 over 2m times p squared plus v. So plugging in our expression for p 
as minus i h bar times the derivative with respect to x. h is minus h bar squared over 2m times d by dx squared plus v of x. So in order then to answer the question, um, what states have definite energy for a particle in a box, we need to understand precisely what it is we mean by a box. Okay. So what do I mean by a box? Well, what I mean is that the particle is only allowed to be in some region of size L. So in particular, that means that I'll take V of X to have the following form. So I'll take it to be a constant. We could say 0 if x is between 0 and L. And I'll take it to be infinity otherwise. If you, so the graph of V would look like this. So this is V of x as a function of x. And this is x equals 0 and x equals L right there. So what that means is that if you think about it classically, the particle will just be between these two um, walls at x equals 0 and x equals L. And classically, the particle will just bounce back and forth between those two walls. Those are the solutions to the classical equations. What about in quantum mechanics? Well, we're looking for solutions of this equation here, the statement that e, that psi is an eigenvalue with, uh, is an eigenstate with eigenvalue e. And just writing down that equation that says that minus h bar squared over 2m times the second derivative of psi with respect to x is equal to e times psi. Um, when x is between 0 and L, and the particle it can't be outside of the box with, that is to say, uh, psi must be precisely equal to 0 if x is less than 0 or bigger than L. Okay, so we now have every ingredient that we need in order to find the energies allowed for a particle in a box. Yes? I made a small typo. Where was my typo? Oh, square. Thank you. Good. Okay. So how do we solve that equation? Okay. That's actually uh, a rather... Uh, easy equation to solve. Uh, yes, question. Yes. Okay. Um, in principle, uh, it could be any number, but there is a, a deep uh, principle in quantum mechanics which will imply that it has to be a real number. Okay. Um, as we'll see, it's going to turn out to be a real number, but in fact, that follows from uh, some sort of a deep principle in quantum mechanics. Um, for those of you who've taken linear algebra, it's the statement that H is not just any operator, but it is a Hermitian operator. Do those words mean anything to anyone, any of you? Okay. Uh, if they do mean things to you, then that's great. And if they don't, then that, that's, that's, that's great too. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and solve this equation. Well, in general, the solutions to this equation that I've written up here say that psi should be a linear combination of a sine and a cosine. Why? Well, if you take the, sine, the second derivative of a sine, you get minus sine. And the second derivative of a cosine, you get minus cosine. And you get a factor of k squared out front because you're taking two derivatives with respect to x. So this equation 
tells us that minus h bar squared over 2m times k squared is equal to e. So that tells us what e is in terms of that parameter k. So now let's ask what possible values that parameter k could take. And we need to use the fact that psi is equal to 0 when x is equal to 0 or L. So first of all, sine of 0 is 0. OK, so that's good for the first time. But cosine of 0 is 1. Okay. So the fact that psi is equal to 0 and x equals 0 implies, sorry, that was supposed to be a b. So a and b are just some constants of integration. And b must be equal to 0. And uh, just since psi at x equals 0 is equal to 0. And likewise, psi at x equals L is A times sine k L is equal to 0 implies that k must be an integer times pi divided by L. Because sine of pi times an integer is equal to 0. This is quantization. In particular, it means that the energy of one of these states with definite energy, I'm sorry, there was no minus sign here. Because you took a second derivative of a sign, you got a minus, and that canceled that minus right there. So plugging that into this formula, we see that the energy is h bar squared over m l m squared l squared times pi squared divided by 2 times the square of an integer. In particular, we see that the energies are quantized. In a problem set that I, th I think you handed in last week, you worked out the quantization of the energy levels for a particle in a box using the Bohr model. And if you did the problem correctly, then you derived precisely this result, um, except possibly for that uh, numerical constant pi squared over 2. I can actually remember if you get the right answer there. I think you probably do. Yeah. Actually, no, you don't. Maybe you do. I don't remember. Question. Yes. Uh, tell me when you got to the square of the n. The square of the n. Because k is n, k is n pi over l here, and there's a square there. Oh, I'm sorry. I, did, I wasn't supposed to square the m. I didn't get it. I didn't, because I'm an idiot. That's why I got the square of an m. Sorry. Let me just uh, rewrite that. h bar squared over m l squared times pi squared over 2 times n squared. So let's go ahead and compare this to the result that we derived for from the uncertainty relation. And again, I was an idiot here, apparently. But nobody was smart enough to, or brave enough to point it out. OK, right? Delta p is h bar over l. e is p squared over m. So that's h bar squared over m l squared. And you see that this answer here, h bar squared over ml squared, is precisely this factor of h bar squared over ml squared here. Okay. So the minimum energy state or more precisely, the minimum energy state with a definite value of the energy has energy h bar squared over ml squared times uh, pi squared over 2. And so you can see that 
the Heisenberg uncertainty principle gave us a perfectly good uh, order of magnitude estimate for this minimum energy. And indeed, it saved us a lot of work. It saved us from having to solve this differential equation. Now, this particular differential equation that told us the values of the energy was not a particularly difficult one to solve. But uh, in life, you know, uh, not every problem is exactly solvable. So in those cases, estimates using the uncertainty relation are incredibly useful. Yes? Couldn't n be 0 and then the minimum energy would be equal to 0? Yes. What happens if n is equal to 0? Well, psi is just equal to 0. Okay. That's not very interesting. OK, uh, another, in particular, there's no particle present. Okay, Because remember that the total probability of finding a particle somewhere is the proportional to psi squared. Okay, So if n is equal to 0, psi is equal to 0, and you're describing a state where there's nothing there. Okay. If you have a particle in a box, however, n cannot be 0. So n should be 1, 2, 3, so forth. Okay. Are there any questions here? Yes. But didn't they already show that when you have those particles in the box, you can't have a fixed value of energy? You have to have an uncertainty. Uh, good. OK. So you, you can't have a fixed value of momentum. If you have a fixed value of momentum, you have an uncertainty in x. And likewise, a fixed value of x, uncertainty in momentum. OK. So you might then go ahead. That's a great question. You might then go ahead and ask, what is the uh, quantity which has an uncertainty if you have a fixed value of the energy. Okay. So if you have a fixed value of momentum, there's some uncertainty in position. Okay. So if you have, this is a good question. So if we have a definite en energy, we must have uncertainty in something. And the question then is uncertainty in what? So in particular, delta E times delta of something okay, should be greater than or of order equal to h bar. So can anyone use dimensional analysis to tell me what that something is? Time. Okay. H bar, OK, or maybe you already knew it. I don't know. Um, H bar has units of energy times time. So in fact, the quantity which appears here is T. Now, this uncertainty relation, this version of the uncertainty relation is actually um, a bit different from the uncertainty relation uh, that we considered previously for energy and momentum. Um, uh, so this is called the energy time uncertainty relation. in that time is not really an observable per se. Okay. Uh, so you have to interpret this uncertainty relation carefully. The way that we interpret this uncertainty relation is that in order to measure energy, uh, energies precisely, It takes an infinite amount of time. Or if you only have a finite amount of time, then it is impossible to measure energies precisely. Instead, you can only constrain them to be in some range of size delta E, given by this formula. So. Uh, uh, your question was a good one because that's exactly what I was going going to say next anyway. Um, now, one thing that I should comment on is that in special relativity, we learned that space and time should be treated on completely equal footing. So you might therefore think that T 
t should be an operator just because x was an operator. But in this version of quantum mechanics that I'm telling you about in this course, that is not the case. Okay? Because we're studying a non-relativistic version of quantum mechanics. In a relativistic version of quantum mechanics, the story would be different. But um, that version of quantum mechanics is actually uh, considerably more complicated. Um, it's called quantum field theory. It is essentially the theory of particle physics. And that's sort of beyond the scope of what I think we're going to discuss in this class. OK. Um, let me pause here and see if there are any questions. OK. Um, I should also mention that if we wanted to, we could also go ahead and solve for the energy eigenstates of the harmonic oscillator by solving the differential equation uh, where the Hamiltonian acting on psi, which is minus h bar squared over 2m d by dx squared plus 1 half kx squared acting on psi is equal to e psi and you would find that just as with the particle in the box the energy levels are quantized and again they're given precisely by the result that you would have gotten when you uh, use the board. Actually, there's a small numerical difference, but uh, they're very nearly given by the answer that you would have gotten when you used the Bohr model for quantization. So that the energies are all uh, h bar omega times an integer. And actually, there is a small uh, correction uh, with a 1 half. Where, so n is an integer, 0, 1, 2, and so forth. Okay. So that the minim minimum energy state will be one where n is equal to 0, and e is h bar omega over 2. Omega being the square root of k over m, spring constant divided by mass. Now, I won't bother to go ahead and do that for you. It's just some mucking around with differential equations. Um, you know, the solution... The lowest energy solution is a Gaussian. The higher energy solutions are Gaussians times Hermite polynomials. Uh, you know, uh, special uh, functions are a lot of fun. Um, uh, you know, there's, not, there's no better way uh, to spend an afternoon than working out some theory of, uh, of orthogonal polynomials. Um, but that's the sort of thing that you're going to do in um, a real quantum mechanics class next year. So for the time being, I'll just tell you that if you wanted to, uh, you could go ahead and do that. It's probably worked out in your textbook. Um, so, so far I have um, developed the theory of quantum mechanics in a somewhat uh, ad hoc manner, uh, presenting to you some ob observational results uh, using some intuitive guesswork uh, some dimensional analysis and some just pulling things uh, out of a hat and declaring them to be true. Um, but what I would like to spend uh, the last little bit of time we have in this course discussing is a somewhat more systematic uh, treatment of the basic postulates of quantum mechanics. And in particular, um, that will lead us to a discussion of precisely what it means when we perform a measurement in quantum mechanics and how we should interpret that. Okay. So what I want to spend our last class doing uh, next class is a discussion in more detail of the postulates of quantum mechanics. Um, I have a couple minutes here, so maybe I'll just give you um, uh, a little bit of an idea of where we're headed. But maybe before I do so, I should pause and see if there are any questions. Okay. 
So we've seen that an observable is an operator, a hat, and that states uh, with definite values of this observable are eigenstates. So for example, the state with a definite value of the observable a hat equal to little a, where little a is some number, will obey this eigenstate equation. So what does that mean about an observation? Okay. So let's say that I hand you uh, a quantum state, some wave function, and I ask you to measure the energy of that state. You'll get some number. And then let's say I ask you to measure the energy of the state again. Well, you should get the same number. And if I ask you to measure it 100 times in a row, you should continue getting the same number. So what that means is that when you measure one of the uh, observables, you actually are changing the state of the system. So in particular, if a system is in a state psi, then the result of a measurement of the observable a hat is one of the eigenvalues of the operator a. And the probability of observing the eigenvalue a should be given by some formula. And this is a formula that we're going to explain in more detail next time. But it is actually the integral from minus infinity to infinity of our wave function psi of x times a different wave function that I'll call psi sub a of x, absolute value squared, where psi sub a is the eigenstate with eigenvalue little a. So this is the rule that one uses in order to determine the outcome of observations in quantum mechanics. So as a check, you could consider um, the case of, say, uh, measuring the position of a particle with momentum for the plane waves that we considered earlier. And one can actually check that this gives you uh, exactly what one would expect based on our previous answer where the probability of finding a particle uh, is proportional to the absolute value of psi. Um, in particular, so for example, um, if the observable A is the position operator, then the eigenstates say, that have a particle with definite position is a delta function. And plugging in this formula, you have an integral of a delta function, which gives you just the value of the delta function. So this is the absolute value of x naught squared. So this is what's known as Born's rule. And it's the rule that tells us 
how it is we're supposed to understand the outcome of observations in quantum mechanics. Next time, we'll discuss this rule in more detail. And in particular, we'll discuss what this means um, for uh, future measurements on the system and the so-called collapse of the wave function. All right, I'll see you on Wednesday. And Schrodinger's cat. Don't forget Schrodinger's cat.